some research and came across this book. As you can see, you know, Library of Congress, Library of Congress, right? This book, The Original History of America, Ancient America, The Original History of Ancient America. I'm just going to leave this right here so you can read what it say right there. But how about this? The present writer will not yield to any man in the firm belief that the Aborigines of North America, but North America only, and the ancient Israelites are identical. Bruh, what? Bro, what is what is go, bro? What is going on, fam? Bro, suspicion has asserted that all the natives of the continent of Columbus might probably have been originally of Hebrew. Is come on, hey man, come on, bro. Again, look, this book is available on the Library of Congress. Okay, I'm gonna go to the title so you can see. If you want the PDF. Inbox me. Inbox me right now, and I'll send you the PDF, the original history of ancient America, founded upon the ruins of antiquity. Bro, they stole this shit for real, for real. And it's sitting right here. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I'm damn. is made up of 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606. It's made up of staves, exactly the same. Now, if that's not interesting enough, look at the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. If you take the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the slope is 51.8 degrees. Let's go back to the earthworks. If you measure the line that goes straight through the center of the structure, right here, and then you go true north, it's 51.8 degrees. That angle is exactly the same angle as the pyramids of Giza. It is the same math, the same calculations as ancient Egyptians. Let me show you one more connection. In 1860, David Wyrick, he's a guy who surveyed the Newark earthworks. He was digging into a mound near those earthworks and he found a wooden coffin made of oak. They opened up the coffin and found a skeleton of a man holding a little box. It was about 8.10 inches in size. The box had been cemented shut here. This, by the way, is sitting in Ohio. Well, he opened up the box and he found a little man inside, a little black stone. They took it to scholars and they looked at it. The man seems to be carrying something. And there's writing here. At first, they couldn't recognize. The writing is, they thought in 1860, some sort of Hebrew. Well, finally, about 20 years later, they found some rabbis living in the area. And the rabbis looked at that. And they could read it. They said it was an old, old kind of block Hebrew, a uh, block Hebrew, and it was a rendition of the Ten Commandments. Now, this is another piece. Block Hebrew. They said they'd never seen anything like it. Mainstream archaeologists at the time called this a hoax. But then in 1900, or just about after 1900, in Israel, they found the same block style Hebrew writing. Mainstream archaeologists still dismissed the findings. They found it in Israel and they found it in Ohio. But there was another stone that they found that they couldn't argue. This is the Bat Creek Stone. It was found during the course of an official Smithsonian evacuation. The Smithsonian didn't understand the uh, uh, the meaning of the. So you mean to tell me they found more stones in America than they found in so-called Israel? Now, this is me. I personally believe they didn't find it over Israel, over the Israel. I believe they put that one there. That's my opinion. Okay, the one that they so-called found over in Israel, I believe it was it was placed there. 
because just like Albert Pike wanted to place the, you know, he said in 1871 that what he was going to do is going to uh, try to place Palace, uh, Israel, the state of Israel in Palestine. And then they came up with the Dead Sea Scrolls and they said they found one over there. But I guarantee you, most all these artifacts came from right over here. I guarantee you that. Writing on the stone. They thought it was Cherokee since it came from Cherokee country. They didn't realize that it's actually Hebrew. They had published this originally upside down. They threw it in a box at the bottom of the Smithsonian, put it in the basement. Many years later, a scholar took it out of the box, looked at it, and went, oh my gosh, it's upside down. It's Phoenician, ancient Hebrew. So what's going on here? What is that about? Where is that history? I'll show you in a few minutes and we're gonna have a conversation. I'm gonna show you some more things that the Smithsonian science, government, commerce colluded to erase. You hear what he just said? They, the government, science, they all colluded to erase this history. So why would you think they tell you the truth now? They all colluded to erase the history. And why? Because it can't be from these Negroes. See, it can't be from these savages, right? These so-called Hebrews. So they had to erase all that information. They don't want people to know the truth. But now the truth is out. Let me back that up one more time. Let's see what he says. Smithsonian science, government, commerce colluded to erase. By the way, I want to thank the directors of the documentary Lost Civilizations of North America for bringing these stories to my attention. I was blown away. To find more, visit the website lostcivilizationdvd.com. Here's the thing we should be asking ourselves. I don't know the story of these. Do you know that? Did you know that? You live in Ohio and did you know that? Why not? Were the American Indians wronged? Yes. Yes. And that's what we focus on in America is we were bad to the American. Forget about it. It's in the past. The question should be the ones that the founders asked. Who are they? What knowledge do they have? Um, according to the definition in the Oxford Dictionary, they claimed on an early U.S. that the early Americans, American Indians, were called niggers. Okay, that's what that's who they called them. But you're astounded, but they already know who the people are, and they've been known who the people are. Can you imagine the difference we would have now if we would put our differences aside and put our past in the past and concentrate on today and say, let's learn from each other. What do you have? What is that? What is that? When we come back, I'm going to be joined by uh, uh, P Peter Lilbach, who is, uh, I told you before, um, is one of my favorite authors. He's going to talk to me a little bit about the founders here. And I'm also going to show you some documents that show how that history has been erased. Next. This is the Smithsonian Annual Report, um, 1882, 1883. This is John Wesley um, Howell. This is an original copy. Um, John Wesley Howell in 1789. Again, this is, uh, this is the, I'm sorry, Powell. This is the director um of uh the bureau of ethnology at the smithsonian institute he said this um artifacts found prior to christopher columbus's arrival would be considered illegitimate by the smithsonian um only the savage indian culture would be observed and this created the artificial bar barrier to science only the savage science was colluding with government because of commerce and religion was involved. Now, why do I tell you all this stuff? Not because I'm an Indian expert or anything else. You got to do your own homework. I, I just found out about this stuff. I'm amazed by it. I don't know what the answer is on this. The reason why I bring it up is the stock 
is not bad. The soup went bad, but the stock is not. Peter Lilback, Dr. Peter Lilback. How are you, sir? Good to see you. This is, a, this is a book that needs to be owned by every American. Every single American should have this book in their home. It's called Sacred Fire. This, these are the words of George Washington, and it takes history absolutely apart, apart. Not on somebody's opinion, but on their own words, on his words. Peter, I want to go to you and talk to you a little bit about, again, the stock. George Washington had a good relationship. Our founders had a good relationship with the Native Americans. Right? There's no question about that. When they came to America, they realized they could not survive without a close relationship with the Indian people. The greatest story, for example, is the pilgrims who are blown off course. 800 miles out of their destination, Virginia, they're in Massachusetts. They land on ground and they're in the middle of nowhere, no government. They make the Mayflower Compact, okay. so they have government when they land. Okay. And there's no Native Americans there because a plague had gone through, but one person shows up. He happens to be a Native American that knew English. He'd actually been taken captive to England. He would learned English. He'd gotten his freedom. He came back as people were gone. The white settlers are there all of a sudden. See that? I mean, he's speaking in code, but obviously he went back and got his freedom. So when have you ever heard of an Indian, uh, Indian that was a slave Indian? And then notice how he said the white settlers that came there, because this guy knows that the so-called Indians, well, a so-called Negroes or the so-called Aborigines, are the same people. And it shows you, like as you saw in in uh, Giovanni Verrazzano when he came, that our people were not savages to him or anybody else, because our people were righteous people. And that's who we were. We're not savages at all. And you hear it again. He said the, the government, Smithsonian, all these people got together to erase us. And we've been truly erased till today. And it's sad. And you're going to notice that Glenn Black on mission, what's going on with the Native and African Americans? <laughs> watch, watch him say it. A sudden, and he meets them and he says, welcome. He speaks English. They couldn't believe it. The providence of that moment is extraordinary. They needed help, and there was a person there to help them. That's and he was a Native American. Right. And that creates Massachusetts. All right. Do I have time for one more story, real quick? No. Okay. Hang on, because I want to come back and talk about. Um, I want to talk about William Penn, because William Penn said something when he was working with the Indians that is critical to understand the truth. I think about America. And we'll do that next. Um, the history, the history that has been erased in our nation, and in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. Y'all hear what he said? See, Glenn Beck is telling the truth. And... And it just shows you the true nature of the so-called government. Because why hasn't the government come out today and told y'all the truth about who the so-called African-American? See, they, they were fast to call us African, African-American, and Black people and colored. And look at all the lynchings, all the murders, all, all the injustice that we've gone through in this country. And all the time, they know who they're doing it to. And the American people, you might not know, but this government knows who we are. We are the real indigenous Americans, and we also are the Hebrews or the children of Israel, as Hitler said, and as the scriptures say. For, for you so-called European Americans, why don't you guys go ahead and read Deuteronomy 28, read through the scriptures. Read and you will see who are the so-called people of the scriptures that the Most High is talking about. And you will see that, that somebody is faking to be those people and there's some people who are actually living the curses of those people. Because right now, 
And that's why if you read the so-called Old Testament, which they don't want you to read, that's why the Most High is coming back. He coming back to set the things straight for his people Israel. Because the Most High said his people perish or are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And they have no knowledge of who they are right at this point. So we're here to wake them up. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into those? Peter Lilback is the president of Providence Forum and the author of George Washington's Sacred Fire. Okay, Peter, um, I think a great place for, for Americans to understand the truth about Americans and Native Americans and African Americans, all of it. It comes from William Penn. Tell the story. Great story. Philadelphia, the great found. First of all, it don't come from William Penn. He don't hold all the keys to the cards to what's going on. And you notice how he kind of like briefly said African American at the end, and Native American, African Americans. <laughs> cause he because Glenn Beck knows that if you look at the copper color people that were here, there was no Africans. And in nowhere in the books that I've read that you're gonna see me go through, they will say speak of nothing of an African. And matter of fact, they'll even tell you that these race of people are like no other when they got over here, the so-called Indian. Okay? So, no. No, no. Founding city of the United States, that's where government began. It was founded by William Penn. He wanted a city without walls. And he determined that he would do it by making a constant commitment to justice and ethics with the Native Americans. There never was an Indian war with William Penn. Mm. And there's a wonderful treaty that still exists that describes the commitment they made. And it says this, there are good people and bad people among all people. There are good and bad Indians. There are good and bad Christians. That's what he called them in Philadelphia. And he said, we must come together so that we will address these problems that will come with respect and by communication. of the good. That's where we need to be. There are good among us and bad among us. There are good Americans, bad Americans. There's good parts of America. There are bad parts of America in the American story. We've got to come together, come together as the good people, stand together and guard against the bad so we can live in a country without walls. Peter, thank you very much. Back in a minute. All right. So y'all hear what he said. And that's why he mentioned African-American, because it's always been, like I told you on my last video, it's always been colored in white, right? Black and white. It has always been this. All these different names they gave us. Colored, black, mulatto, Negro. Names keep changing. And it's still the same today, right? African-American and white. Like I told y'all, where are the, the Native Americans at? Hmm? Where are they? Where are the ones that they portray on the Indian movies? You don't see none of them. But just like you, you'll you see when you go through these passages of these books, there was millions and millions of us, and it still is. We haven't gone anywhere, okay? We still here. Yeah, so this is a picture of the guy, George Jones, who wrote the book. This is a, this is George Jones. And here's what he wrote. An original history of an ancient America founded upon the ruins of antiquity, identity of the Aborigines with the people of Tyrus and Israel, and the introduction of Christianity by the apostle St. Thomas. So they brought Christianity to the Americas. You see that? They brought Christianity to America. And this guy right here, observed and, and watched the Indian to so-called aboriginals for years and concluded that these are the Hebrew Israelites of the scriptures. Okay, so as you're about to find out, and the name of the book is The Original History of Ancient America. Give a shout out to Tamar for giving me this uh, information. Tamar is a subscriber. She, subscriber. she gave me the information of a video, the video that's played earlier. So, and we went into the book a little bit, and we're going to check it out for ourselves. And now, this is not the only book that you've seen that said the exact same thing, you know, about the so-called, how many times have you heard, even in the movies, that 
that the lost tribes of Israel were in America, right? And that's why the Hebrew Israelites could be on the street corners, but a lot of them are still mixed up in Christianity, not knowing that that's false. But as you see, if you go through my videos, you will see that that's false, and I'm going to keep on showing that. All right, so here's the book that we're going to get into, okay? And again, this made, was just made in 1843. So that's why I say get a hold of these older books, okay, before they're gone, so you can get the real history, and they describe the people, what they really look like. Versus what Hollywood shows you today. And everybody's been taught in school a total different curriculum, but not the truth. So y'all just check this out. All right, so y'all see my screen, right? American, a Native American, originally applied to the aboriginals or carpet color races found here by the Europeans but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. So when they for Europeans got here, they saw carpet colored people, right? Carpet colored people found here by the Europeans. This is what they saw, right? So you see this? This is cinnamon, brown cinnamon. And that's the kind of person they saw when they got here, copper colored people, just like a uh, if you pull up a penny. So this is what they saw, or a person who looks like me. Okay. And now most American people do not know the original definition of an American or so-called European people. They don't know this definition. They don't understand this definition. They don't, they, they haven't been taught this definition. But this is the original definition of an American, originally applied to the aboriginals or copper color races found here by the European. Now notice that guy, you see this guy right here, right? Now you, today you'll put an Indian right next to him. They look the same, right? If you change his hair, he just put his hair a little down. He'd look like a, he'd be considered an Indian. So that's how you know another, and like I said in my last video, that's why they get rid of the Redskins helmet. Because they, because the information was coming out to the fact of who the real copper color Indians were and still are, right? And so they had to get rid of that. And then they called the commandos. So I just wanted to show y'all that. So now we're gonna go back to the, the book. All right, so now we're back on the page, okay? And it says, religious, okay, the language as uttered to by Tecumseh, Tecumseh is not written by the pen of fiction merely to uphold a theory of the brain, but gathered from the archives of a people's history to support a theory of apparent truth. The present writer would not yield to any man in the firm belief that the Aborigines of North America, but North America only, and the ancient Israelites are identical. Unless converted by the stern authority of superior, sub, superior historical deductions, deductions. So he said he's not going to be moved unless he finds something that's more superior than what he's finding out. We therefore have form an original theory in, re in reference to the natives of the North and the those of South and Central America together with the newly discovered ruined cities in and around Guatemala. And by that theory have separated into two distinct races or people, the Aborigines of the Western Hemisphere. So he said that the Central and South American people are different than the people of North America. They're two different, two different types of people. Okay, now I'm going to go down, I'm going to skip down. He says, suspicion has asserted that all the natives of the continent of Columbus might probably have been originally of the Hebrew extraction. Their assertion has been made in doubt and trembling. See? The assertion has been made in doubt and trembling. 
for writers have been confounded by essential contrast in the religious customs of the North and South America. There are no analogies between them. With, with, circum, with circumstance should have compelled historians to pursue another path of inquiry. Because he was saying that there were two different distinctive uh, cultures. And so to attain to a conclusive truth, but they found Gordian knot which they could not unravel. They found a Gordian, Gordian knot which they couldn't unravel. And assuming the impatient weapon of Alexander, they destroyed it. So what they were saying is that, what he's finding out is that the people of North and South America are pretty much different uh, people. They have different beliefs and everything. So I'm just scrolling down the page. And here it is right here. He says, taken as a basis for our illustration, the rules of argument, we will first identify one race and then prove that the existence of another is not only apparent, but absolute. So he's saying he's going to prove it. That's not only apparent, but it is absolutely or factual. For the convenience of the general reader, the word Mexican, until the true name is established, will be applied throughout the following pages to all Central and South America. For the word South may be confounded with that portion of the Republic of North America, so denominated, and especially with the American reader. The fundamental error with all writers upon Aboriginals, Aborigines of America is that they have viewed them as one people. So he said that's a fundamental error because the people of the North America are not the same as the people from Central and South America. So he said he's going to call those Mexicans from Central and South. Authors have therefore been confounded by the different customs and ceremonies of religion as practiced in the two great divisions of the continent. They have seen that the natives were, to a certain extent, in one part of the vast do domain, idolaters, and not in others, that the North were essentially Republican in every aspect of political existence while that of the Mexican or Central America was essentially composed of kingdoms and empires and governed by despotic monarchs, and that republics were interwoven with them, that each man in the North was a warrior and an equal, and, and, and an equal acknowledging no superior, but their leader in time of battle, and should he fall in action, there was not a member of the tribe in which they politically lived, but could have taken his place and filled it with similar courage and ability. So he said in the North, they had no leaders. Is that that every man was equal. But in, in Central and South America, in Mexican America, they were not equal. But from the, from the imperial, they descended by degrees to the serf and the slave. In that country, stone and structured stuccoed temples and palaces were and still continue to be found e erected with costly magnificence in which they were jeweled idols to which they bent the knee. So these people were worshiping idols. Their rich dwellings were splendid mansions adorned with sculptured and beaten gold, graced with the work of art, as a people enjoying all the refined elegances of life. But in the north, their temple was the azure canopy of Jehovah, adorned with its myriads of golden stars. And when beneath the sublime dome, they bent the knee, it was to the almighty God alone. So the people of the north didn't bow, didn't bow down to worship idols. They only bowed down to the most high alone. Their palaces were the gorgeous vistas of the forest. The columns were with gigantic trees each year, increasing in their stateliness. Their shadowy painted roofs were the far spreading branches and the nature's tinted foliage. Their mansions were those of independent wanderers, even the simple tents of Israel. 
and for jeweled idols and figure of beaten gold, they presented the diamonds of human eye, radiant with intellectual beams, glancing from the living emblem of the first and priceless image placed in Eden Garden of the architect of the universe. So, notwithstanding these essential opposites in character and policy to which may be added that of synonymy, writers have glanced at them as one race, sprung from the same branch of the human family and without defining which. And when they could not reconcile such apparently unaccountable distinctions and diversities, they have thrown upon the shoulders of the Mexican the mantle of many virtue belonging to the North. So they said they just put them all in one group. And upon this race, they have thrust the idolatrous vices and the festering robes of luxury justly claimed by the former people. Okay. And by this easy manner of disposing of a question have seemingly satisfied themselves that by blending the crime of both to the to, to, to the exclusion of the right virtues of either, they were all savages. So he they, they deemed everybody a savage. And no matter, and no matter from whence they came, they was a savage. Thus have they formed their conclusions concerning 50 millions of human beings. Although directly in opposition to the evidence of fact, to deductions by relative reasoning and to all Christian feelings which alone should have rejected such cruel a decision, founded as it only as it is not only on slight but careless investigation. So he's saying the two people are not the same. And so they just lumped them in all in one bag. And look how many the people. They said 50 millions of people. So for them to say that this land was not inhabited, it's a bold-faced lie, right? It was millions of people on here. And that's why, just like any other continent, though, right? There's millions of people. You can't wipe everybody on these continents. It's impossible. A sufficient identity of the northern native is now required in order to establish the national distinction between aborigines, between the aborigines of the two Americas. In all civilized countries, when the okay, so I'm so so that's what they're trying to do now. So they're just trying to find the truth between the two, okay. So I'm on page seven now at the bottom. And it says, we think that it will instantly be admitted that all, page eight, re religious ceremonies are the strongest proofs of the characteristics of a people or race of which no written history exists. So they had no written history, but there is something so indescribably sacred in the conscientious actions of a man with the supreme God that none but the maniac atheist could doubt that the, those actions should be received as living features of a nation when seen to be recognized and acknowledged with as much certainty of identity. And when a mother gazes upon her fondly cherished child, the custom forming the analogy between the Northern natives and the ancient Israelites will now be reviewed with as much brevity as the subject will permit in order to establish an essential point of the present theory. Now, remember, he said, Glenn Beck said that stone of the tablet, they found that in excavated in the 1860s in Ohio. This is 1843, but this guy has been living amongst them for a while observing are watching them and observing the so-called aborigines. And even in so even before the 1863, he's saying that these people are the ancient Israelites. They act in one and the same as the same people. Listen to this. 
a separation of the aboriginals into two distinct people. The reader perhaps will meet us at the threshold of argument by the question. What question? How can an Indian be of Israel? Y'all see that? We will answer this and refute the misnomer before the analogies are investigated. The name Indian, as applied to the original inhabitants of either or both the Americas, Canada, the islands in or adjacent to the Gulf of Mexico, have no authority founded upon truth. So he said that name Indian has no authority founded upon truth. Y'all hear that? The name was given in error and has been so continued from the time of the, now I don't know how to pronounce this name, so y'all forgive me if I do it wrong, Gen, Genonisi, Genoese, to the present day. Throughout this work, no position will be advanced that cannot be defended. So whatever he's saying, whatever he come up with, he said he's not going to put something out that he can't defend. The wrongful appellation originated with Columbus. So Columbus was the first person who messed up. And for, for proof of the assertion, the following is presented. The shadow of the earth upon the morning during an, an eclipse plainly testified that the planet upon which we live was round. The travels of Marco Paulo, by land to the East Indies, about 1269, related that those lands stretched far towards the east. About two centuries after this, it occurred to Columbus upon pursuing those travels, but more especially from having obtained intelligence from the final conquest of the Canary Islands in 1483. And, in, and information while resident in England with circumstances will be investigated hereafter, he put in parentheses, that by a voyage towards the West, thus traveling as it were around the globe, he should meet the extremities of those lands. And as the discovery of and sea passage to the East Indies was the great object of navigation in the 15th century, Columbus made the bold attempt uh, and discovered that the island of San Salvador and those adjacent and think that, that he may have reached the eastern extremity of the Indies, according to his theory, he then named those islands the West Indies. So sailing east, he went west, so he figured, so he figured, okay, yeah, so he named it West Indies. So Columbus thought he was in the West Indies, y'all, because they were discovered by sailing west. The discovery of the continent following during this third voyage and believing all the land to be of the Indies. The inhabitants of the Isles and of the mainland were as natural consequence, as of a natural consequence, called by Columbus under one general appellation, Indians. Subsequent geographical discoveries have proved that the, that the great era of the Guyanese, but the name of Indian was given at that time, and it has been continued, although at variance, at, and it has been given, it has been continued, although at variance with the truth. So it's against the truth, and it has had a marital effect in checking inquiry. So the name Indian, and this is coming from George Jones in 1843, he stated that that name is wrong. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, the name is wrong. He stated, but in the name of the Indian was, but the but the name of Indian was given at that time, and it has been continued, although at variance with the truth. And it has had a material effect in checking inquiry concerning the Aborigines who have been called Indians. See, so the Aborigines were called Indian. And even though we were called Aborigines, that's still 
is the wrong name. The name seemed at once to specify their origin, but it would have been equally as just if he had determined to sail to Britain. And an unforeseen gale having cast him upon the island of Sardinia, and then from believing that he had reached the intended object of his voyage, he should have called the latter inhabitants British. So if he would have made the same mistake, then he would have been calling people British who were not British. So we therefore discard the name of Indian as applied to the natives of the Western continent. So according to George Jones, he said they, they, dis, they disregard or discard the name Indian as he applied it to the people of North America. See? To the name of the Western continent. It will be retained in the tragedy of Tecumseh for local purposes and write of, and write of them as the Aborigines until as we advance in, in this history they can be identified by a national name founded upon facts and conclusions. So he tell, they gonna call them, he said, we're going to call them Aborigines until we get some facts of history to, to what to call them or find out who these people are in the, in the North America continent. All right, so now I'm in chapter two of the book. I'm just going to kind of like scroll through it. It says the Hebrew analogies now claim the investigation and as women is first in the affections and in memory, she claimed by the right upon this and upon all occasions, the natural precedence, right? The Northern mother after childbirth is secluded for a given number of days. So talking about when they said the Northern mother, talking about the North American mother, right? Or the North American so-called native. Or aborigine after childbirth is secluded for a given number of days varying according to the sex of the newborn infant and it says by the law of moses the mother of purification was a, to last 40 days for a male and 80 days for the female child all other seclusions are as strict as when the wife becomes a mother when a wife becomes a widow and is childless her husband brother marries her these were essential laws of the Hebrew, and especially the latter, that the name of, of the name should not be lost in Israel. As a mother, she considers it a religious duty that the child should receive its nourishment from the breast that gave it life. And such is the feeling in the performance of the maternal duty that she often nurses her offspring until it attains three or four years of age. From this fact, an important problem is solved. The apparent tardiness in the ratio increase of the aborigines of the North, for, in the, for it is the rule in nature's female code that while the affection continues from the fond practice of the mother, no other shall arise to destroy that which already exists. But, at, but as that ceases, and the firstborn is put away, nature jealous, jealous of her supremacy again bestows upon the mother a second joy. And so continues in her undeviating course. There is also a direct physical analogy between the northern mothers and those of ancient Israel. If there were not, the negative might be brought against this theory. We therefore take advantage of this affirmative. The only cause of Pharaoh's political action against the Hebrew was that from the rapid ratio in which they multiplied, they would eventually rebel and with, uh, without, and with or without assistance of any other nation entirely subdue Egypt. So that's why they put the Planned Parenthoods in our neighborhoods today, or, or the so-called abortion clinics, right? Because the rate of fast we multiply. Still the same people. And that's what Marcus Singer wanted to do. Put them abortion clinics up in our neighborhoods. The only cause of Pharaoh's political action against the Hebrew was 
that from rapid ratio in which they multiply, they will eventually rebel and with without the assistance of any other nation entirely subdue Egypt. The ease of childbirth by the Hebrew mother is distinctly stated in the Holy Writ, because it's talking about the Holy Scripture, in contrast to the dangerous sufferings of the Egyptian parent, from which fact may be gathered the cause of gradual but certain uh, increase of the Israelites over the Egyptian population. The same peculiar facility of childbirth is one that of chief characteristics of the northern female. For in the Rocky Mountains, while journeying in cavalcade and being taken in travail, the mother will leave her companions alone and within an hour will remount, re, will remount her horse and overtake her associates with the newborn infant in her arms. The cause of why the population of the Aborigines of the North is not in ratio with the ancient Hebrews has, all, has already been alluded already been alluded to. In reference to the mother's belief and practice of extended maternal duty and fondness, if as we believe the greatness, if, if as we believe the great ancestors of these Northern women were Leah and Rachel. So y'all know who Leah and Rachel were, right? If you go back to the Bible, they were married to who? Jacob. And Jacob's name was named changed to what? Israel. So he's saying these northern women, their ancestors, the, the, the talking about their great grandmother or their the who she, they are uh, these are the offspring of these children. Who you're looking at now are the offspring of Leah and Rachel. I'm gonna read that again. If as we believe, the great ancestress ancestresses of these northern women were Leah and Rachel, the tender eye, the beautiful, and the well favored. Then have their daughters on the western continent lost no features of their mothers of Israel. Wow, so he's saying they were beautiful. I remember, beautiful. But they might hang their harps upon the willows of their faith as emblems of Jerusalem's children in captivity and feel no shame in comparison of sorrow, grace, or beauty. He put that in parentheses. The Northern Aborigines have a traditional knowledge of the deluge and the dove of peace. So they talk about, so they know about the flood, Noah's flood. That's what he's talking about, the deluge, the flood, and the dove of peace. So y'all know that when Noah released the dove, out to fly and came back to show that the waters were abated. The dove, the dove didn't come back the last time. Right? And so the dove, so that dove of peach, which to them under the, the name of the medicine or the mystery bird, is sacred from the arrow of the hunter. So therefore, when they shot that in the show, look, the Aborigines, you see they had bow and arrow, and he said that when they were out hunting, that they that bird, they did not hunt that bird because it was sacred. They have the their Ark of Covenant, wow, in which is de deposited some mystery seen only by the priests of the tribe. It is said to be a shell supposed to give out oracular sounds. This is an, an analogy to the book of the laws placed in the Ark of Covenant by Moses. Preceding his death on Mount Nebo, the oracular wisdom of which guided the civilization to this day. Wow. Which has guided the civilization to this day. So at the time of his writing, to this day was 1843. Y'all see that? The ark is never suffered to touch the earth but is always raised on a stand of wood or stone. It is invariably carried by a tribe when they march to battle, and a similitude is here to Joshua at the siege of Jericho. When, when is it in their peaceful encampment, it is surrounded by 12 stones, indicated of the original number of the tribes of their ancestors. This is strictly an analogy 
with the 12 statues, privately ruled blocks of stone, erected by Moses around the altar of the covenant to personify the 12 tribes of Israel. Joshua also, after a passage of the Jordan, erected 12 stones in his encampment at Gilgal, and the same number in the river at the place of the passage. They select their medicine men from among a portion of the tribe, not warriors. Here is the custom of the Levites or the descendants of Aaron being the sacred office of priesthood. For with the Israelites, they were not to be taken from the ranks of the soldiery. So they do the same thing likewise. These aborigines dwell in booths and when both and when brought out of the land of Egypt, for they are still wanderers. They offer a flesh or burnt offering from the chase, which is first cast into the flames before even a starving family may eat. They have, they have their corn and harvest feasts. Also, one is one in observance of every new moon. That means every new month. Another in festivity of the first fruits and the great feast in direct analogy with the Hebrew Passover. Even to the blood being stained upon the post and lentils and the mingling of the most bitter herbs. So, wow. So, the, so all these Hebrew traditions they were doing when he saw them as he's living among them. As he's watching them. And he's, and he's been amongst them for years. And so that's why he's writing about them. I, I hope y'all understand it. This is what he saw in 18... Well, this is what he wrote in 1843. But he obviously he was years in there before that. And notice y'all, we had heard nothing about an African. And notice that the Aborigines, as I just read you the definition, were carpet color races. Right? So when you go back to the Chief Colonago video that I did, and Chief Colonago was talking to the person on the reservation, one of the head people, he said, remember the guy from the reservation told him that there was no dark-skinned people on the land of America. The European, he said, was here first, and they brought the and they brought the uh, uh, so-called copper color or our people here from Africa. This is starkly contrast what he said. He's telling you point blank of the people that were here, and he's observing them while they were here, and he calls them the Aboriginal because the word Aboriginal means the first. That means these are the first people that they encountered when they came on the land. In other words, they were already here. Let's keep reading. Then their fastings and purifications are practiced with great severity. The breastplate or ornament worn by the religious prophets containing 12 shells or stones of value is in direct imitation of the ancient pictorial worn by the Hebrew high priest. Wow. Everything that they're doing, they're doing exactly as it said out of the scriptures. So I think for uh, some of my Indian people who call ourselves American Indians, as you see, the name was a misnomer. And it was just showing you that and then a lot of people said, well, the, a lot of so a lot of the people who uh, also uh, know that we were native to this land, they are also against the Hebrew Israelites. But I think y'all need to take a second look because the indigenous people and the Hebrew Israelites are one and the same of America. And this government knew it the whole time and still know it today. and which contained 12 precious stones inscribed with the names of all the 12 original tribes of Israel. Wow. They have their cities of refuge or huts of safety where the most deadly foe dare not enter for, for his victim. They never violated female captive and upon the Hebrew principle that their blood shall not be contaminated by interunion. So in other words, they didn't mix with other races. 
So if they caught a female, right? They didn't rape her. They would not have sex with her. So that just shows you how strict they were when it comes to this. See, they never violated a female captive. And upon the Hebrew principle that their blood shall not be contaminated by interunion. This has been strictly followed in all their wars with the Europeans. See that? Who are they fighting against? In Deuteronomy 28, the Europeans came to a, what I said, when you read Deuteronomy 28, he says, send a nation against you from afar. And you see by his own writings that they were warring against the Europeans that were coming into America. And these Europeans were warring against the children of Israel. And they will pay. So at least somebody telling the truth. And this guy right here is telling the truth. This has been strictly followed in all their wars with the Europeans. They also reject the savage practice of civilization upon lofty principle of manly virtue. The medicine bag or pouch is carried by every member of the tribe. It is suspended to a bee belt which crosses the breastplate by passing over the left shoulder and hangs on the right side. It contains, as they say and believe, preservatives to keep them from sickness or defeat. Wow, I wonder what was in there. These are essential, the phylacteries referred by, to by the Savior and previously condemned by Moses. For the word phylactery, phylactery is derived from the Greek tongue and denotes a preservative. And in the time of Moses, they were worn by his people in great access, and so and so by the northern native. Wow. So they were the same. So everything is identical, as he stated earlier, to the what was written up of the scriptures of the Hebrews, they're actually living it. And there was no written script. This was the life they were living. Moses checked the excessive use of the preservatives and changed the custom. For by his command, the priesthood alone wore the phylactery, which was at last a frontlet of parchment for the forehead, upon which was written an extract from the laws that those that run might read. Then the absence of all idols or symbolical devices and the worship of the one God, the great spirit. So they worship the most high. They don't have no idols, it says. So like North and South America, I mean, excuse me, like Central and South America, they were worshiping and bending their knee to idols. They only worshiped the most high. They had no idols within their camps. And this something. Okay. They're never pronouncing the name Jehovah or Jehovah or Yahuwah, but in symbol, but in syllables. And those separated by long ceremonies. Thus truly fulfilling the Hebrew law, thou shalt not take the norm, the name of thy Lord, thy God in vain. Wow. The name with them sounds as if as if written Yahovah, and only pronounced by Aaron of the tribe, by the Aaron of the tribe, so the priest. In their hymns of rejoicing, the word hallelujah is distinctly uttered. Do y'all hear that? Praise y'all. Hallelujah. This guy's writing this in 1843. Of years of observing these people. Our people. To the foregone analogy is to be added the general and firm belief in the immortality of the soul. 
but beyond all this as proof of their origin is the practice of the great covenant between the almighty father and the patriarch Abraham circumcision. Wow. So they were doing circumcision. And it does not exist as in parts of Egypt and Asiatic nations for the purpose of supposed health in which belief was practiced in ancient Egypt, but by both sexes, but as a religious custom handed down from the time of immemorial. The custom now is not general, but it does exist. And we must be understood as referred back at least 200 years in our review to the period of the Pilgrim Fathers when the Northern Aborigines numbered 15 million, 15 millions, oh, excuse me, 15 millions with an S. So when the Pilgrims got here, you know how they try to say they found the land that nobody was on? You see that? And, this, and remember, this is 1843 when he was writing this. They found an abandoned land. That's what it's, that's what everybody want to tell you. But the Northern Aborigines numbered 15 millions. And what color were they? I'm going to keep saying this. They were the copper color races. They were not the people you see on the reservation, y'all. And those copper color people are still here in America. Now they scarcely number two and a half. So now they, they he said now they scarcely number two and a half million people. So you see that y'all millions and now just two and a half because they've been killing us with disease and wiping them out, wiping us out. All the customs, however, noticed are practiced at the present period by the uncontrolled Aboriginal. See, all the practices at the time of he writing this, all these practices that he just went over are being practiced by the uncontrolled Aboriginal, what they call a savage. So the ones that were under control, they were not doing it anymore, of course. But the ones who are out on their own still, they were still practicing the laws as stated by Moses that was given to them. If all other evidence were not received, that of circumcision as a religious ceremony must be reviewed by the most skeptical as a direct proof of identity between the Northern Aborigines and the ancient Hebrews. The customs we have written is not general it is only found in the more settled tribes. You see this, y'all? Again, this government knew and still knows who we are today. And they, go, I mean, I'm just sorry to say, but they will pay for the, what they've done to, uh, to the Most High's people. As the Most High already said, as I read to y'all out of the scriptures already. You came over to this land. Now you got his, you got his, his people in projects. And they're the most trodden down people in this country. Police are shooting them down, right? Drugs is pumped into their communities, abortion clinics, alcohol, drugs. They've been, they've been killed and taken off their land, discriminated against constantly. Everybody coming here thinks they're better than these people. And the fact is, our people are the true inhabitants of America. And this government knows it. And of course, a lot of, when I say government, a lot of European people know the truth about, I, I, to me, I wouldn't want to be a European person or anybody coming to this land and you mess with the, uh, you mess with the most highest people. You understand that you're only here because he allowed you to let this happen to us. That's the only reason you, you can do what you did. But a time of reckoning is coming. He came over here and gave us a false deity to worship. Wow. Anyway, so he says, 
The custom we have written in is not general. It is only found in more settled tribes. This even supports our belief for this very fact is traced again, the proceeding ordained by, by Moses. For circumcision was discontinued by the great lawgiver for 40 years during his journeying with his followers through the wilderness. The custom was reestablished by Joshua. May not this innovation by Moses in the covenant custom be imitated by these descendants? Are they not still wanderers in the wilderness in the Western as their ancestors were in the Eastern hemisphere? See, he's thinking we come from the East. The affirmative, the affirmative has existed for ages and it even now continues. They have not yet returned to Jerusalem. One fact is of great importance is in proof of their great antiquity. They have no knowledge or tradition in the north of the life or crucifixion of Christ. Do y'all hear that? They have no knowledge or tradition in the north of the life of crucifixion of Christ. So, in other words, they know nothing about God having a son to die for them. Now, why would God send a son to die for them in Jerusalem while they over in America? I mean, I don't know why he didn't ask that question. That don't even make sense. So you had a son that's going to die for the sins of the world. Meanwhile, your people over here in America, and they don't know nothing about your son that you just died on the cross for your sins. Because it never happened. As I've been showing y'all, and as I can, will continue to show y'all the resurrection deception that will be coming up soon. I will be doing the resurrection deception, so y'all stay tuned for that. I already showed y'all the virgin birth. You go check out my virgin birth video. I already proved you the fact, and I could have did a lot more to show that all the stories that concerning Christ were false. He's a made-up deity of the Greek people once again. The reason why they didn't know anything about Christ because they worshiped the one true God, the Most High. And the Most High said he would never put another God before him. But we're going to get more scriptures when I get into the scriptures and show you more about the Most High. All right. So I'm going to read that one more time. One fact is of great importance uh, in proof of their great antiquity. They have no knowledge, no knowledge of tradition in the north of the life of crucifixion of Christ. Yet they have a knowledge of the flood and actually practice the laws of Moses. So what does that tell you? They were still following the laws of the Most High because that's what we were supposed to have been doing, his laws, statutes, and commandments. But a lot of our people were not. And he told you, if you don't obey, then he told you that these people will come across your land and take over. And you're going to be the bottom. They're going to be the head. You're going to be the tail. They will lend to you. You shall not lend to them. The stranger shall get above you very high and you shall come down very low. Is that not what's going on today? The immigrant is coming to America very high and our people are still falling, falling lower and lower to the bottom. So they knew about the flood and they knew and they, they followed the laws of Moses, but they knew nothing of a Christ. Now, don't you think that the Most High would have said something to his people about, I got a son coming to go die for your sins? They had no knowledge of that. So why are y'all in churches today? Because you've been brainwashed by the Europeans that came to America, and they gave you Christianity. That's why you got a church on every corner, because now this is a Christian nation, and they brought up their sanctuaries and put them up all over the place. It's like they have mosques over here too as well. That is not who we are. And you can't tell these Christians anything. But this should be eye-opening to anybody who looks like me who's going to a church today. You should come out of that church because that is a false religion and you have been brainwashed 
And that's why you don't know who you are. And now you call yourself an African-American. You have been mislabeled and misnamed over the years. You have many different names and they knew why they did that to us. And we the only people in the whole world, y'all, that keep names, keep changing. And now you know why. You hear what Glenn Beck said? The government was part of this. They wanted to deem us just savages. Anyway, let's keep going. Again, we must repeat that we are writing of these Aborigines as they were at the time of European colonization. See that? Again, we must repeat that we are writing of these Aborigines as they were at the time of European colonization. So he's telling you who they were and who they are. The above singular fact enables us to at once to place them in chrono chronological position. It must be an, it must be after Moses, but before the Savior. See that? See now he, put, he, he see how he interjecting his part of it. He trying to figure. He trying to put it in chronological order. He said it must be after Moses, but before the Savior. But another fact brings their circle of time still narrower, they have no tradition or the destruction of the first temple of Jerusalem. They don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about the Romans coming in and destroying the temple. They don't know nothing about it. Because a lot of their stories are just stories that they came up with. Don't y'all see that? This evident, this event occurred 588 years before Christ. See, he's talked, and again, I'm glad he's writing what he's writing because he's, he's, he's stating his beliefs and what he's been taught. And he's trying to now, now he's with the Hebrew people, but they don't know nothing about none of the stuff he's talking about because he was in Christianity, which came from the European people which came from Constantine and all that was going on over there, right? See, this was their thing. But now he encountered the real Hebrew Israelites, the Aborigines of America. And they don't know nothing about this stuff. This event occurred 588 years before Christ. It must therefore be anterior to the national calamity that they trace their origin. So he's trying to figure it out. Of this hereafter, when in the next volume, the history of the Israelites will be given. But even now, justice to this race compels us to offer a few words in their defense as a people, for being already sufficiently shown that they are of the great Hebrew family, they may fall in the estimation of some readers upon religious principles. It has been shown that they have no tradition of the crucifixion or the desolation of the temple. Is there no sentiment in the mind of the Christian reader at the first fact is unfolded other than that of historical data? Upon a moment thought, it must be apparent that the blood of Christ cannot be upon them or their children. <laughs> you already just said. <laughs> so you get, their ancestors never shouted in the streets of Jerusalem, crucify him, crucify him. Do you hear what he just said? The blood of Christ, because when you go back and read the scriptures, well, not the scriptures, the New Testament, you will find that they said the Jews turned the Christ over to Pontius Pilate to be, uh, to be uh, hung on the cross, right? And they said, crucify him. Who do you want, Barabbas or Christ? They said, crucify him, crucify him, right? Well, that's what the New Testament says, that that's what the Jews did. But like I told y'all, the Jews and Hebrews are two different people. The Jews are the people over there from Ukraine that y'all fighting the war with now. The America is backing over there. 
they that's the caucus mountains y'all those are those people and the real hebrews are following the scriptures and are still following the scripture today ain't that something go back and watch my last video the hebrews of the bible are still on the bottom the true hebrews israelite the israelites which is us and we know nothing about crucify him, crucify him. And so this guy is writing in 1843 of what the people, and it, it, it came to America, and they were the Hebrew Israelites were over here, the so-called Indians, the so-called Aborigines are us. And we have no concept of Jesus because we worship the true and live in Elohim, the most high. Period. The one true God, not three in one, not the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this guy is writing it in this book and it's telling you right to your face. So I need y'all to come out these churches, my people. All right? Their ancestors have never shouted in the streets of Jerusalem, crucify him, crucify him. The Aborigines of North are Israelites and the house of Jeroboam, not Jews. See? Not Jews of the house of Judah, a distinction of all importance as the pages of the subsequent volume will prove. Wow. Wow. So I hope y'all are getting this. I'm gonna skip down some more and find some more information out of this book. Then I'm gonna come. Then I got another couple of more authors to check out, and then I'll be done with this video. All right, y'all. So I'm gonna pick it up right here. All right. It says. It may be there mentioned again and to the internal honor of the Northern Aborigines and as stern reproof of the wars of civilization that they have never been known to violate a female captive among their own race upon the principle that it is it is placed shame upon the warrior's glory. So then they didn't even, they wouldn't even rape somebody of their own because it will put shame upon the warrior's glory. Wow. This noble manhood has also extended the same mercy to the white female prisoner. You see that? So if they were if they said the white female prisoner, then what color were the people that we talking about, y'all? Hmm. But we already know the color. Because they already told us, right? But these people are now called black people or African Americans. Have y'all heard anything about an African yet? Now, mind you, this guy said it was 15 millions of these people on this continent when they got here, and it never been brought down to two and a half million. It's not like he counted each one, but I, you know what I'm saying, right? He was just saying the estimate how many people were here. I think that in the Deuteronomy 28, he said, you were, uh, the most I said, you were as the stars of heaven, but now you become down as few. Go read Deuteronomy 28. I'll just go back and watch my last video. Because they came over here bringing disease and murdering and killing and raping. But, uh, but from our people, we didn't do those things. Because we had honor. And the government deemed us as savages. So imagine the people coming over here when they went back to the ship. They told them, yeah, there's a bunch of savages over there. So they came in over here to war, even though they know that the people were peaceful to them. This noble manhood has also extended to the same mercy to the white female prisoner as of those of their own color. Is there not the ancient Hebrew even in this? And is not there national abhorrence of interunion with any people but their own traceable in this custom? See, and right now, 
that's why they they are mixing they have they 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 mixing all over TV now because they know that this is a board in the in the in the in this Hebrew tradition in the from from the most high. The most high is against this. All you gotta go read is Ezra chapter nine and ten. Go to the Old Testament or the so-called Old Testament, y'all. Get your Bibles and read Ezra nine and chapter ten. It's, I think it's another one in Nehemiah too, but it, 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 Ezra is nine and ten, and also even says it in the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven. But Ezra is nine and ten, so if anybody want to know about mixing, should you do that or not? But you see on TV they're promoting it everywhere, right? Especially amongst the indigenous or the Hebrew. Because now the Hebrew and the white and, and so forth, they're out there, is on every TV commercial, in every movie, right? But this was forbidden by the Most High. So this is what he's talking about right here. Re, re Ezra 9 and 10. All right. Is there not an ancient Hebrew even in this? And is not their national abhorrence of interunion with any people but their own traceable in this custom? They also, upon the same principle, will not marry or cohabitate with the pale face race. With the pale face race. They do now. Because it's being pushed all over the media. Or with any not of their own blood. Now we cohabitate with everybody. But didn't it say in Daniel, I told you in my last video, Daniel chapter two said the last kingdom, before the most high come back, they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. And that's how I know one thing, and it's in the fourth kingdom. And that's how I know that we are in that last kingdom before the most high comes back. Because they are pushing this strong. We write of the Aborigines as they were and of the mass. That's how the majority of them were. There may be on the frontier some solitary exceptions after their acquaintance with the Anglo-Saxon race, but oftener among the women than men. And he's going to tell you why. This arises not from less virtue than the in the opposite sex, but and with shame be it written. So he's saying it's more so with the women that will, will be with somebody else than, the, than, the, than the one of the uh, men. But he's going to tell you why. But he says he's writing this with shame from seduction, treachery, and dissertation by the European. So basically they will rape the women. They will snatch them and rape them. This arises not from less virtue than in the opposite sex, talking about the male, but as with shame be it written from the seduction, treachery, and dissertation by the European. So who was the savages? Most truly might a chieftain replay to a missionary who endowed to convert a tribe. Endeavored, excuse me, most truly might a chieftain reply to a missionary who endeavored to convert a tribe. Teach us. Then it says, what? My son has been murdered, my daughter ravished by the white man. Learn first yourselves to obey the mandates of humanity and prove that we do not practice them. Then come among us to preach or teach and we will receive you with open arms. When shall we, when shall we meet again upon this condition? O earth, white man, never. The marriage of the Virginia Aboriginal Pocahontas was after her baptism in the Christian faith. Wow. And consequently cannot be brought to bear against the preceding remarks. So, she became a Christian. She was baptized into Christendom. 
So who brought this religion over to America? The Europeans. And then she ended up marrying what's it that John Smith, whatever his name was, something like that. <clears throat> Man. And consequently cannot be brought to bear against the preceding remarks. Mm -mm -mm. Many other religious customs and ceremonies exist of a minor character, yet strictly in analogy with the race of Abraham. But enough has been brought forward in this volume to propose these, as we believe, unanswerable questions. If they are not the lost tribe of Israel, then who are they? What nation of ancient history can claim an identity, those customs, and, and observances as their own, if not the Hebrew? Wow. So that's what he wrote. All right, so now he says this is the physique of them. The, the physique of them, they, they possess the central characteristic of the ancient Hebrew in regard to their psychonomy, the broad and elevated forehead, aquiline nose, the high cheekbones, brilliant red countenance, countenance and teeth pure as ivory, black hair, the dark heavy brow, the sunken but brilliant eye, like a diamond with a ring of pearl, and both deep set beneath the bow, the brow of ebony. The, the brow of ebony. Y'all know what color ebony is? Hmm? Ebony is brown. See, ebony and ivory. Know the song? Ebony and ivory. That's what it was about. Their figures... Their figures in use from their mother's care are models for, for the Apollo. And should the statue be lost, it could be restored from a living archer for the attitude of the sun god in a dedicated, he's talking about the, 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 uh, the physical physique, strong physique looking. They can just make a statue. If the statue was broken of Apollo, they can make one just like that, just based off of the person who's living right there in front of them. When they swing, when they when they wing their arrows at the uh, pythons of the chase. Let's see. He said, "The reader must not imagine that our enthusiasm upon the subject has betrayed us into the language of poetic rhapsody, for we have the authority of Benjamin West, who when." He first arrived at Rome to commence his, his studies, was regarded as a savage from the New World. In order to surprise him, the statue of Apollo was shown to him with great ceremony by the savants, who expected that he would be, over, be overwhelmed with wonder. He simple, his simple remarks was, why, why? It is a model from a young North American Indian. It was the highest compliment that could have been given to the grace and the dignity of the statue. The color of the ancient Israelite must not be judged by that of the modern Jew. For, for various climates, local circumstances, and confidence, habitations have given the latter a dark, heavy, swarthy countenance. Even in the Middle Age, they are bent in figure, but the ancient light red tint may be but the original of certain burnt features of the aborigines. See, he tried to say, so the Jews over there, you know, those people that know, he's talking about because of the climate. No, it ain't no climate change. No matter where you go or where you go, our Hebrews are Hebrew, and we look like Hebrews. We're not going to change because of the weather. It's just who we, this is what, this is, this is who we are. Just like when a white man goes into Africa, does he come back black? No. Right? He don't come back. He ain't gonna never be black. And just like if I go to the, go in the snow, I ain't gonna go turn white because I'm singing out in the cold and I'm not gonna just turn white. It's not gonna happen. Aborigines, as they from their forest life reach at least three score years before before old age compels them to see their shadows as they walk. All right. 
So, so uh, I think this is pretty much enough from this book. I just want to kind of, because I got some other books, I, want, I mean, other places I want to show y'all some real brief writings. So this hold tight. All right, y'all, so I'm in something else. And it's uh, I'll get the name of it in a minute, but um, this is basically it just showing you some the ideas of the so-called Cherokee Indians, or so-called Indians, as the same as the Hebrews, right? As the so-called Jews, whatever, right? So I'm gonna pick it up down here. Um it says when the Israelite died in in the house, any house. Now look at the writing, y'all. This is written way back in the day. So the letters is kind of different, as you can see. When the Israelite, it's like the F, the S is an F. So when an Israelite died in any house of or tent, all who were in it, and the the furniture belonging to the to it contracted a pollution, which continued for seven days. All likewise, who touched the body of the of a dead person or his grave were impure for seven days. Similar notions prevail among the Indians. The Choctaw are for exceedingly infatuated in favor of the infallible judgment of their pretended or oh yeah, pretended prophets as to allow them without the least regret to uh it's hard to read this writing. Oh desolate oh yeah desolate I guess the next of any of their sick who are in a weak state of body to put them out of their pain when they perform when they perform or presume to reveal the determined will of the deity to shorten his days which is a, which is a, asserted to be communicated in a dream by the time that this deal physical operation is performed on a patient they have a uh, scaffold prepared opposite to the door whereon he or is to lie still till they remove the bones in the fourth moon after to the remote bone to remote bone house of that family they immediately carry out the corpse mourn over it and place it in the dormitory which is strongly uh perforated around left left the children should become polluted even by passing under the dead formerly when the owner of the house died they they set fire to it and all and to all the provisions of every kind of 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 or sold the whole at a cheap rate to the trading people without paying the the least regard uh the least regard to the fact to the scarcity of the items many of them still observe the same rule through a went a wild imitation of ceremonial observance of the Israelites in burning the bed wherein a dead person lay because of its impurity. This is no copy from the ancient heathens, but from the Hebrews. Like the Jews, the greatest part of the Southern Indians obtained from most things that are either in themselves or in the general apprehension of mankind loathsome or unclean where we find the deviation from the general rule among of them it is corruption either owing or to their intercourse with europeans 
or having contracted an ill habit from uh, necessity. They generally affix very vicious ideas to the eating of impure things, and all their prophets, priests, old warriors, and war chiefs, before they enter on their religious duties, and while they are engaged to them, observe the uh, <laughs> what is this? Architect abeyance in their point. Formerly, if any of them did eat in a white people's house or even of what had been offered there while they were uh, sanctifying themselves, it was deemed a dangerous sin of pollution. When some of them first corrupted their primitive virtue by drinking of our spiritist liquors, the religious spectators called it Oka, Okahuma, bitter water, alluding, I, I conjectured, to the bitter waters of jealousy that produce swelling and death to those who committed adultery but had no power over the innocent. That this name is not accidental, but definitely pointed and expressively of the bitter waters of God seems obvious not only from the images they still retain of them, but likewise, when any of them ref refuse or invitation to of drinking spiritist liquors in company with us, they say, Ahikola Awa Uka Huma Itu. I will not drink. They are the bitter waters of the great one. Though the Itu, one of the names of God, for be joined to nouns denotes a superlative superlative degree in the calf they de devi deviate from the general rule and from this reason they never affix the idea of a bitter to spiritist liquors we drink among them Homa is the only word they have to convey that meaning bitter and uma bitter ears or pepper they reckon all birds of prey and birds of night to be unclean and unlawful to be eaten. They reckon all birds of prey, which is right, and birds of the night to be unclean and unlawful to be eaten. No, not long ago, when the Indians were making their winter hunt, the old women were without flesh meat at home. I shot a small fat hawk and desired one of them to take it, dress it, but though but though I strongly importuned her by the way of trial, she as earnestly refused it for fear. Wow, so I did just show you who the people are. Now you can see how the writing is, how they wrote back in it. It's hard to read this. So I hope that's why I got it on the screen for y'all to see it for yourselves so y'all can maybe can read it better than I can. But they would not put any unclean thing and fix any unclean file or any un anything that's unclean. And, and, and the rest of the honey camp to be spoiled. Never, never, nevertheless, he shut his ears against his honest speech and brought those dangerous deer skins to camp. But the people would not afterwards associate with him and he soon paid dear for being, um, I don't know what that word is, hawkish, by a sharp splinted root of a cane running almost through his foot nearly the very place where he first polluted himself, he was afraid from worse ill was still in, in a wait for him. 
1776, 1767, the Indians were struck with a uh disease which they were unacquainted with before it began with sharp pains in the head at the at the lower part of each of the ear and swelled in their face and throat in a very extraordinary manner and also the testicles it continued about a fortnight and in the like space of time went off gradually without any dangerous consequence or you use out of outward and inward remedies they called it waka abika the cattle's distemper or thick of, of sickness some of their young men had by stealth killed and eaten a few of the cattle which the traders had brought up okay so the other people brought these up and they imagined that they had thus polluted themselves and were smitten in this strange manner by having their head, neck, and and magnified like the fame parts of a sick bull. They first concluded either to kill all cattle or send them immediately off their land to prevent like mischief or greater ill from be befalling the beloved people for their cunning old physicians or prophets would not undertake to cure them in order to inf inf inflame the people to execute the former resolution being jealous of encroachments and afraid the cattle would spoil their their open cornfields upon which account the traders arguments had no weight with the red Hebrew philosophers. But fortunately, one of their head warriors had a few cattle soon presented to him to keep off the wolf, and his reasoning proved for weighty to so weighty as to alter their resolution and produce in them a contrary belief. They reckon all the those animals to be unclean, that either carnivores or live on nasty food as hogs, wolves, panthers, foxes, and cats, mice, and rats. See, and they going by the so-called, the, no, they going by the rule that the Most High gave them. Everything they just mentioned right here is unclean. The Most High told you in Deuteronomy and Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14 what you can and what you cannot eat. And all those are an abomination. But these, but these people, these Europeans were coming in, bringing in to the people to eat for food. And if we accept their bear, they deem all all beasts of prey unhallowed and polluted food. All amphibious quadruple they rank in the same class. Our old traders re remember when they first began the custom of eating beavers. And to this day, none eat of them except those who kill. Except those who kill them. Though the flesh is very wholesome on account of the bark of the trees they live upon, it must be acknowledged they are all degenerating, a, a degenerating a, a, a pace insomuch that the Choctaw Indians, on account of their uh, Let's see, I don't know what that word is. Oh, scantings of ammunition while they traded with the French took to eat horse flesh and even snake and snakes of every kind. Though each of these species and every sort of reptiles are accounted by the other neighboring nations in pure food in the highest degree. And they ridicule the Choctaw for their cannibal 
apostasy and term them in common speech the evil, ugly Choctaw. They are born moles for exceeding, so exceedingly that they will not allow their children even to touch them for fear of hurting their eyesight, reckoning it could, it's contagious. They believe that the nature is, is possessed of such a property as, trans, as transfuse into men and animals the qualities either of the food they use or of the, those objects that are pretended to their uh, senses. He who feeds on venison is according to their physical fitness or swifter physical and swifter and more sagacious than man who lives on the flesh of the clum clumsy bear. You know, I, I, I'm going to stop reading it because it's hard to read the words that they wrote, how they wrote back in the day. The flow. Okay, so if they basically is saying if you ate the deer meat, right? The physical, your physical ability is better, swifter and more uh, sagacious than the man who lives on the flesh of the clumsy bear or, or helpless dunghill fowls the, the slow-footed, tame cattle, or the heavy wallowing swine. This is the reason that re uh, several of their old men recommend and say that formerly their great chieftains observed a constant rule in their diet, seldom ate of any of, any of the gross quality or heavy motion of body fancying it conveying a dullness through the whole system and disabled them from exerting themselves with proper vigor in their marital, civil, and religious duties. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there on this one. Y'all see it's kind of hard to read, but you see that they practiced the laws of the Most High. These were the so-called Indians of America, the so-called Aborigines. They pretty much follow the dietary program that the Most High set up for them of the clean beasts you shall eat and of the ones you cannot eat. And y'all can go look that up. So these Europeans that were coming here saw this, then they were eating anything. And they wouldn't even dare cook the flesh of some of the things that they were eating. Okay? So let's just show y'all more of who the people were that were here, that are still here. All right, so you know y'all see what's on my screen, right? So this is a book by Samuel George uh, Morton. It's called a, it's a an inquiry into the distinctive characteristics of the Aboriginal race of America. See that? And it was written in 1844. Okay, let's name the book again. Now we're gonna see that the 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 what they he said the so called American Indian what they look like, right? Distinctive characteristics. Let's look at their physical characteristics, right? So let's read this. Uh, All right. In its adage, among traveling travelers that he who has seen one tribe of Indians has seen all. So much do the individuals of this race resemble each other, notwithstanding their immense geographical distribution and those differences of climate which embrace the extremes of heat and cold. Because that's what America has, right? Heat and cold. He says, so regardless, even though some from the cold and some from the hot, they all look the same. The half-clad Fujian shrinking from his dreary winter has the same characteristic lineaments, though 
an exaggerated degree as the Indians of the tropical plains. And these again resemble the tribes which inhabit the region west of the Rocky Mountains, those of the Great Valley of the Mississippi, and those again which skirt the Eskimix on the north. All possess alike the long, lank black hair, the brown or cinnamon colored skin, the heavy brow, and the dull and sleepy eye, the full and compressed lips, full lips, see, and salient but diluted, dilated nose. So let me show y'all something. He said that they possess the what? The cinnamon skin right here i got some cinnamon you see this that's cinnamon all right cinnamon skin so they telling you what the people look like now i just put that cinnamon on my skin and you can barely tell see that look at my hand but that cinnamon is on there all right, that just shows you what he's talking about. Now, again, I'm going to show y'all after that I've showed this video, we're going to go to Google. We're going to see what copper color people look like and what they don't look like. All right. So anyway, he called them cinnamon brown. See, brown like I am or cinnamon colored skin. That's what the people look like. All right. Full and compressed lips and the scented but dilated nose. These traits, moreover, are equally common to the savage and civilized nations. <laughs> Savages. Whether they inhabit the margins of rivers and feed on fish or rove the forest of subsist or spores of the chase, it cannot be questioned that the physical diversities do occur. Equally singular and inexplicable 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 as seen in differences shades of color varying from a fair tint of complexion to almost almost black see this what they he said this is the color of the people and that's why they found copper colored races here as you still see today the so-called aboriginal american is still here he is now called the african american and this too under, under circumstances in which climate can have little or no influence. And it don't. No matter what, we're going to, just like the scripture said, each seed going to produce after its kind. Okay? So <laughs> this, is what, this is who we are. This is how we're going to look. So also in reference to the statue, the differences are remarkable in in entire tribes, which moreover are geographical approximate to each other. These facts, however, are mere exceptions to the general rule and do not alter the peculiar uh, psychonomy of the Indian, which is as undeviable characteristic as that of the Negro. See, there you go. For whether we see him in the athletic cherub or the stunted charmer, in the dark Californian or the far fair Barora, he is an Indian still and cannot be mistaken for being in of any other race. Now, hold on. Did this person say anything about Africans or African? So they knew what an African was. And he said that these people cannot be mistaken for being any other race. And nowhere did we read in the other one that I read, or in the other two I read, matter of fact, when these Europeans came to these Americas, they saw copper colored brown to almost black people. The same people that are here today died in the projects. They never went anywhere. But America has been has put a great sin upon itself. And they will pay for what they did. They have been of a false God, which is Jesus, put in their Christian churches, 
then reclassify the indigenous people or the Hebrew people as they kept changing our names. And to the point now, we're just African Americans. And most of our people are Christian and don't know who they are. And all this was foretold that this will happen or befall us by the Most High in the scriptures. The part of the Bible that they don't read, what they call the Old Testament, the part that they say that is done away with. That's where the truth lies of who you are. We're not just indigenous to America. We are the true aboriginals and the true Hebrews. And our people had customs, as you saw in some of these writings. Now, I hope y'all can read some of it better than I can. But I'm just trying to get through it because it's hard to read what these people wrote back in the day. Because even in the way they spoke. All right. The same conformity of organization is not less obvious in the ostrich logical structure of these people as seen in the square or rounded head, the flattened or vertical occiput, the high cheekbones, and the ponderous maxillae, the large quadrilateral orbits, and the lower receding forehead. I, had, I have had opportunity to compare nearly 400 crania derived from tribes inhabiting almost every region of both Americas and have been astonished to find how the preceding characteristics in greater or less degree pervade them all. This remark is equal, equally applicable to the ancient and modern nations of our continent. For the oldest scores from the Peruvian cemeteries to the tombs of Mexico and the mounds of our country are the same type as the heads of the most savage existing tribes. The most savage existing tribes were the person who's saying that other people are savages. Because you are the people that came into other people's land and stole, raped, killed, and murdered, and took over everything. So who's more savage than that? Their physical organization proves the origin of one to have been equally the origin of all. The various civilized nations of this day represented by their lineal descendants who inhabit their ancestral seats and differ in no interior respect from the wild and uncultivated Indians. See, <laughs> look at how they, they speak of them. Wild and uncultivated. You came to a land that we had been here for centuries, thousands of years. And now they're wild and uncultivated because you say so? At the same time, in evidence of their lineage, Calvary Vir Cal Vigero and other historians informed us that the Mexicans and Peruvians yet possess a latent mental superior superiority which has not been subdued by three centuries of despotism. And again, with respect to the royal personages and privileged classes, these is undubitably undubitable evidence that they were of the same native stock and presented no distinctive attributes except those of the social or political character. So, let's see. I'm not going to read all this. So I'm just trying to show y'all that there are a lot of books out here and the truth is not being told today. And before these books disappear or before they be changed the wording, y'all might want to go take a look at some of this stuff just to show y'all um, what the people, what were their practices, uh, what the people look like, and what was going on at that time. Because there's a lot of information. It's just that you got to go through a lot of reading and research. And I'm just right here. I don't want to make this video too long. But I'm just kind of like trying to show y'all uh, what they said. And what the Negro or what the uh, so-called Native American 
look like? Saying that's copper color people. Copper colored people. Right? Let's put it in copper color people. All right. Let's go to images. All right. So y'all see this? Let me make this bigger. It was bigger before, wasn't it? All right. So the question is, on this page right here, right? Let's get back over. Let's get back to Google real quick. The question is, who is copper color? Right? All right, let's show you. Y'all see this right here, right? And they got two sides. Who is copper colored? Okay, so right today, this is what you call an Indian today. See this? This is the Indian today. And it's showing you what side is copper colored, right? As you see, no side look like the people that's on your right hand side. But all the copper color look just like the people on the penny. American, originally applied to our Aboriginal or copper color races. See, and think about it, y'all know Aboriginal people all around the world are dark skinned people. So why not? Why what's what's gonna happen in America that is gonna change? Except that we were the copper color races that were already in America. And yet, this person, these people now, a mixture of white, European, and everything else, as you just watch the, um, go back and watch my video, the reclassification, and you can see, and they, they, they've admitted of their own selves. They're who they are. And these people think they are the copper color. They don't even fit the definition of an original American, do they? So how can they claim themselves to be the original people here when they don't, and, all, and everything we just read and all the stories we just read over, even the people, they don't describe people that look like them. But then not only are they original American, they also are the Hebrew. Here's another. Let's see. See that? Look at Kobe Bryant. This guy, Kobe, see that different shades of copper? Look at Kobe. Kobe is copper color. This guy is not. You can put a white man next to him and they almost look the same. And it's not to be, you know, any, say anything, it's just what the, the truth is. So, Every time you see copper colored, and like I told y'all last time, this is why they got rid of the rash skin helmet. Look at that. Somebody said, what's this? You know it's bad when the fake outrage of white Native Americans amid the African Americans represented their own Native American heritage is so blatant, racist, and hypocritical. Right. You see that? And I didn't, this is in Google, y'all. Y'all can put this in, type this in Google and all this will come up on your screen. So like I said, this country knows and America knows who the real Americans are. And yet we're going around calling us, they calling us Africans. And a lot of our people have waken up to the fact that nowhere are we African and we also know that we are Hebrews. And you're not going to hide that anymore from us. It's like Bitcoin. It's out now. It's decentralized. Everybody know. And it's spreading everywhere. Look at this. See? The fake. This guy right here, this Iron Eyes, Cody. And he was an Italian. I think he was an Italian or Sicilian or somewhere from there like that. Played the Indian on the TV when I grew up, when I was growing up. But here's a real... American Indian. 
This is Sue Chief skin color, hair texture, and the real features. But this is what they portray on TV, Hollywood, or Hollywood. They're lying to you. Everybody's proving it everywhere. Look at this. Today, this is the Indian on the right, and this is now an African American. But back when this movie was out, she wasn't an African American. This this is D from uh, What's Happening. During the time of this, when this, this aired, of course, this is when Roots came out, not to around this time frame, but during this time, we would consider black people. And y'all know the other word term, right? Y'all know the other term that they use, the other definition for American, American Indian. What did they call an American Indian, right? So let's look up the word nigger. Right? Oxford Dictionary. Let's see who was called a nigger. I'm going to go to all. Okay. That's what it says. Right. Let's see, get back to it. To a. Oh, they say a black nigger. <laughs> oh boy. Say Negro, <laughs> nigger. What's that? They uh, I hope they didn't change it. Let's see, nigger. Oh, Oxford, nigger. Here you go. This this is the old one. Two A, three A. Okay, here it is right here, y'all. Y'all see this? You gotta go to the old Oxford. Okay, so a dark skinned person of of any origin in the early U.S. Use usually with reference to the American Indians, usually offensive. You see that? A dark skinned person of any origin in early US used usually with reference to the American Indians. Where the American Indian when in the early US when the Europeans first arrived. Okay? Case closed. All right, so so there's more proof that not only are you the American indigenous Americans, but you're also the Hebrew, which this government already knew and still knows today. And like Hitler said in that letter that we wrote from Hitler, he said that they hold the Jews of the most high. And they have the Negroes. For they are the true children of Israel. Go back and watch my last video. All right, y'all. So I think I'm going to end this video now. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And I'll catch y'all on the next one. Peace out till next time. Continue to do your homework, y'all. Continue to study and continue to put that truth out. And like I said, before I go, this is not to be racist. Because the racism happened to us and it's still happening to us. We are now telling the truth and putting the truth and putting it straight. Our people were not Christians. Christianity came to us. They gave us Jesus. Our people know what the most high. We know nothing about Christianity. But now all of our people are pretty much Christians. So I'm going ahead to disprove that. To show you that that's false. He gave us a false God and gave us a false identity. But we're going to come and take that back. Peace till next time. And I'm out.